Good evening, everyone. I'd have to concur with Megan that yes, this is one of the most important topics related to sheep and goats. So I work at a research center in Keatesville, Maryland, which is in Western Maryland. If you know where the Antietam battlefield is, we're in the kind of in the area of that. We do research at our research center with small ruminants. For many, many years, we ran a buck test, mostly Kiko bucks, and we were trying to identify bucks that were more resistant to worms. Now we're doing sheep research. We're in the third year of that. In fact, we just brought in 80 lambs about a week and a half ago. They're all Katahdin ram lambs. We're gonna divide them into two groups. Half, the, half of the lambs are gonna graze really good quality pastures. The other half are gonna graze very similar pastures and we're gonna supplement them with energy every day, whole barley. We're gonna look at differences in parasites, but the lambs, when they came in, we collected a fecal and they don't have very many parasites. So I'm not certain we're gonna see much difference in those lambs and I'm not certain we're gonna see a very high level of infection, which from a production standpoint, that's ideal. That's what everybody wants. From a research standpoint, we'd kind of like some parasites. So we're just a little bit different. Like Megan, I, I also have a small farm and I raise sheep. Some of the pictures you'll see in here will be of, of my sheep. I raised uh, Katahdin's, have about 35 views and I've raised sheep my entire life. Work more with goats professionally, although I did used to have some goats, but the sheep boated them off the farm. Okay, so we're going to talk about the barber pole worm tonight. The scientific name for the barber pole worm is Homonchus contortus. We just typically call it the barber pole worm. It is a blood sucking parasite of ruminants. So it can affect cattle too. It can affect any animal that has a rumen. So it can't affect horses or poultry or swine. But it's especially a parasite of small ruminants, which includes sheep, goats, alpacas, and llamas. The reason it's called the barber pole worm is because it looks like, in appearance, a barber's pole. It's, it's red and white. You can kind of see it in the picture there, kind of red, red and white. Uh, the, it's probably more of a pinkish color, which is, the, uh, which is a reflection of the blood that the worm sucks. It's a large worm. In fact, uh, some places around the world, instead of calling it the barber pole or barber's pole worm, they just call it the large round worm. It's the biggest, with the exception of tapeworms, which are quite large, and the only worm you can see in the feces, the barber pole worm is quite large, up to an inch in size. So if so, when they cut the animal open and look inside the stomach, the abomasum, they can actually see this worm. A lot of the other worms are way smaller, and even coccidia, which is a protozoan parasite, you can't see that at all. So the barber pole worm develops in the abomasal wall of the host. So the abomasum is the, the, the stomach. Ruminant has four parts to its stomach and the abomasum is the true stomach. And this is where you find the barber pole worm. In the case of a camelid, an alpaca or a llama, it's called C3 because camelids are not ruminants. We sometimes call them pseudo ruminants. They have some similarities, but they only have three parts to their stomach. So the barber pole worm has a kind of like a tooth and it lacerates the stomach wall, which causes blood to trickle down, and then the worms eat or consume that blood. So the adult worms, which also lay eggs, consume the worm, and also the immature worms, what we call the L4 or the fourth stage larva, they also consume blood. So you could have an animal that is suffering from barber pole worm, but doesn't have a very high fecal egg count because the immature worms are sucking blood, but not laying eggs. The barber pole worm used to be considered a tropical parasite, like down in the Caribbean, you know, Florida, you know, parts of Africa, more tropical climates. But it's kind of adapted to different places in the world. It's a parasite that needs, uh, that prefers a warm, moist climate, which is very typical of, of a lot of areas in the summertime. And it has adapted to areas throughout the United States, but it's gonna be most problematic in the warmer, moister climates or the time of the year when it's warm and moist, like when you get rainfall during the summertime. But you go far north, like we often get folks from Alberta on some of our webinars. It is a problem in Alberta as well, just not as long throughout the year as it might be in Maryland or even further south. They have found barber pole worms 
in the snow. It's important to understand the life cycle of worms in order to be able to control them. So this picture, which is an Australian graphic, shows the life cycle of the barber pole worm and other round worms. When you hear the word strongyl, that's basically a round worm. And there are others besides the barber pole worm, but in this warm, moist climate, they are secondary in, in importance. If you go to England, Ireland, the barber pole worm is not as big a problem. In much of Australia and New Zealand, it's not as much a problem. People often ask, well, why do our recommend recommendations often differ? Because the climate is different and the nature of the parasite problem is different. So it starts out, we have an adult worm inside the animal. That adult worm lays eggs, sucks blood and lays eggs. The eggs are in the manure. When we want to get a fecal egg count, of course, we collect a manure sample and look at those eggs or count those eggs under a microscope. Those eggs will hatch into larva. They'll go through two molts. You can see at the bottom, I say L1, L2, and L3. Those are the different stages of the life cycle. The L3, the third stage larva, that's the infected form of the larva that the animal consumes while it's grazing. Once that L3 is ingested, it will develop into an L4, which is that immature worm, which isn't yet laying eggs, but is sucking blood. And so that cycle goes round and round until something disrupts it. And as you can see off to the side, I say it is very, it is weather dependent. It's fairly consistent that it takes about three weeks for that L3 to develop into an adult. So that's fairly consistent. But to go from an egg to an L3, that is very much weather dependent. So weather is everything when we're talking about parasites. So as I already mentioned, the barber pole worm needs warmth and moisture or humidity to complete its life cycle. When the weather is favorable, the egg can go, you can go from egg, so egg deposited in the manure, into infected third stage larva as short as three to four days. So we'll talk about that later from a pasture rotation standpoint, but that's how quickly it could go. Now, when it's cooler, it takes longer and it could take months to go from egg to infected third stage larva. In the Mid-Atlantic region, Maryland, Delaware, our primary disease outbreaks of barber pole worm are usually in the mid to late summer. You can see there at the bottom that scale. So the dotted lines represent when the barber pole worm, under what temperatures it's active, and where you see 77 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit, that is when it is most active. So as we get into the summer, and those temperatures get up into the 80s and 90s, that's when the barber pole worm is most active, which means it's uh, going to develop from egg to larva much quicker than it would say in April or in September. So temperature is very important, but rainfall is also very important. Rainfall is needed to release the larva from the manure so if it's too dry, the larva stays in the pellets, but then it rains and there will be a release of larva. And in a few weeks, for example, you could expect to have a problem. So the life cycle is very dependent on what the weather conditions are. So in a drought, the barber pole worm isn't nearly as big a problem. But then when that drought ends and you get rainfall, you can have an outbreak. When it's really cool, the barber pole worm is less of a problem. Some of the other parasites might be more problematic, particularly in other parts of the world that have cooler, wetter climates. So what are the signs of barber pole worm infection? Well, since the barber pole worm is a bloodsucker, the symptoms are gonna be associated with losing blood. So two primary symptoms that we see are anemia, which is pale mucus mucous membranes and edema, 
which we call bottle jaw because it typically occurs out of the jaw of an animal. Other symptoms are more generic and could be indicative of other problems and other parasites, but are quite common to barber pole worm infection. Just the general ill thrift and failure to thrive, kind of like you see that lamb in the lower left corner, just a, a poor doing lamb. Uh, they get lethargic, they get weak, they get anorexic, they lose weight and body condition. But sometimes instead of seeing a poor doing animal, you simply find a dead animal. And this is particularly true of young animals, particularly true of animals that aren't carrying a lot of body condition. Death can be sudden. You can simply find them dead. What's not a symptom of barber pole worm infection is diarrhea or scours. So if you've got lambs or kids that have diarrhea, it's not barber pole worm. It could be other stomach worms. Uh, it could also be coccidia. So we know that sheep and goats can be affected by a variety of parasites. The number one is probably barber pole worm, but diarrhea is probably gonna be indicative of another problem. And it's certainly possible for them to have parasites of different kinds at the same time. Talk about these symptoms in a little greater detail. So anemia, which is the primary symptom of barber pole worm infection, is a decrease in the amount of blood cells in the whole blood. And you can see in the graphic there that, um, you know, what anemia is. We call it pack cell volume when we talk about livestock. Uh, in people, we often call it the blood hematocrit. In reality, the diagnostic test for the barber pole worm wouldn't be a fecal sample. It would actually be a blood test. And the FAMACHA system, you see the card up there in the upper right corner, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. It actually predicts pack cell volume. It's trying to predict the level of anemia, therefore the level of barber pole worm infection, therefore the need to deworm. Now, the FAMACHA system is based on looking at the color of the membranes of the lower eyelid, but it, you can also see paleness in other mucous membranes like the gums or the vulva. Now, there can be other causes of anemia and bottle jaw uh, in small ruminants. Other parasites, for example, in particular liver flukes, Liver fluke can look just like barber pole worm infection with both anemia and bottle jaw. Sometimes coccidia, although with coccidia, you're likely also to see the, the scours. Uh, trauma can cause anemia. Uh, chronic diseases, in particular Yoni's disease. And nutrition, particularly malnutrition or, or protein deficient diets, you can also see anemia. Okay, what about bottle jaw? This shows uh, on the left a picture of a sheep and on the right a picture of a goat. Bottle jaw is an accumulation of fluid under the skin of the lower jaw. What happens is gravity causes fluid to pool in the loose tissue while the animals have their heads down eating. When we did the buck test for 11 years, we only saw a couple of cases of bottle jaw, including the one pictured there. I think sheep are much more likely to have bottle jaw, and it makes sense because they're much more likely to have their heads down when they're eating. If a goat had its way, I think its head would never be close to the ground. It would always be eating high. So bottle jaw is a result of severe anemia and a shortage of protein in the blood. There are other causes, just like I indicated in the last slide, but the, by far the most common cause is barber pole worm infection. Now, it's important not to get bottle jaw confused with a couple of other things that you might see. Again, the animal on the left has bottle jaw. It's directly under the jaw. The lamb in the middle has what we call milk goiter or milk neck. And you can see that's right kind of where the Adam's apple is. That's in the throat. That's not a bad thing. It's not a disease. Uh, it's very common in hair sheep, in animals that are doing very well. It can also happen in goats. If you see it in an adult animal, it probably means you're overfeeding. 
And then, of course, you can also have an enlargement um, in that area uh, due to an iodine deficiency, goiter, which you see in the picture on the right. Uh, more common in newborn animals, um, but probably can happen in situations where there's an iodine deficiency. So that's kind of the difference between those three as you look at them. So why is the barber pole worm the number one killer? Why is it so difficult to control? Well, first of all, it's a highly pathogenic parasite. It, it doesn't take long and it doesn't take many to actually kill an animal. As I've already indicated, it has a short direct life cycle. So no intermediate host and it doesn't take that long. The fecal is a very prolific egg layer, up to 10,000 per day, which is why fecal egg counts can be actually quite high and the animal can actually be okay because she's such a prolific egg layer. It's also what makes fecal egg counts in, in our area difficult to uh, interpret because unless you know which parasites are laying eggs, it's hard to know whether that's a high egg count. It's a voracious blood feeder, 0 0.01 mils per day. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when there's a lot of worms, it can cause a lot of blood loss. It's a very adaptive worm. It has the ability to go into an arrested state called hypobiosis to survive, under, survive undesirable conditions. In our climate, that's usually over the winter. In some climates, that can also occur when the weather is hot and dry. So basically that L4 goes into hibernation, hypobiosis, and it begins to resume its life cycle in the spring when the weather becomes more conducive. There you can see a picture of an abomasum just filled with barber pole worms. It's become more difficult to control the barber pole worm because the worm has developed resistance to all of the dewormers and all of the dewormer cl chemical classes. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Sheep and goats are easily infected with, with worms because particularly in the case of sheep, they graze very close to the ground and they also graze very close to their manure pellets. They're very vulnerable hosts especially goats. Young animals, especially under five months of age, they don't have any immunity to these parasites. And in the case of mature animals, the pregnant and lactating female suffers a temporary loss of immunity around the time of birthing. Paripartrit means around parturition. So about two weeks before birthing up to eight weeks after, her immunity is compromised. It's a combination of nutrition and hormonal. Her egg count goes way up and that becomes a source of infection for the lambs and kids that will graze those pastures. So how do we manage the barber pole worm? How do we keep it from causing our animals to have problems and to causing some of them to die? Well, there's two ways that we're gonna do this. One is simply, what I call husbandry or, or management, how you actually raise and take care of your animals. And that's the number one way that you are going to prevent problems. The second one, and it looks like the word got cut off, is deworming, so the drugs. So we're gonna go through some of these different things that you can do before you even should be thinking about using a dewormer. What can you do to keep the barber pole worm from being a problem? So we'll start with the husbandry practices or management. First off, you need to consider the animal's immunity or what we will also call resistance. First, it's normal for small ruminants to have parasites of different types. What's also normal is for them to develop immunity with age and continuous exposure to low levels of parasites. It's only when they're exposed to too many parasites that we get disease problems. So ideally that lamb and kid is born and gradually gets exposed to different types of parasites and is able to develop immunity. There are differences in immunity or resistance among the species, sheep versus goats, among different breeds within those species and among different animals. Remember I mentioned in our buck test, we were trying to identify bucks that were more resistant to parasites and we did. There is also a nutritional cost to immunity. So when that animal mounts an immune response to parasites, protein from his diet will be diverted to 
that immune response and it will be diverted away from growth lactation. So this chart just kind of goes over some things that, that shows you which animals are more susceptible, so which have poor immunity, and which animals are less susceptible and have better immunity. Species understand that goats are more susceptible to worms than sheep. They're both pretty susceptible, but goats are more susceptible. And one of the reasons is because the strategy of the goat is simply to graze high, browse, and vo avoid ingestion of infected worm larvae. We actually had a speaker say that goats never develop immunity to parasites. They do, but it's not as good or as complete or as quick as sheep. The sheep strategy is to develop immunity. We have breeds that are more, that are less resistant to parasites. And we have breeds that are more resistant. On the sheep side, the resistant breeds would include the hair sheep that come from the Caribbean or North Africa or West Africa. That would be the Barbados black belly and the St. Croix. The Katahdin as a composite would also be more resistant. The Gulf Coast native or various native sheep of the Southeast are more resistant. There's some evidence that the Texel might be more resistant than some of the other wool breeds. On the goat side, uh, we know that the very susceptible breeds are the dairy goats, the angora goats, and the boar goats. Probably more resistance in the Kiko goat and the myotonic goat. Savannah, not really sure yet. Age-wise, young lambs and kids are more susceptible than older animals, particularly those under five months of age. Those that have just been weaned are more susceptible than those that are still on their moms. If animals have never been exposed to parasites and they all of a sudden get put in a field, a pasture, then they are more susceptible. Poorly fed animals are more susceptible than those that are well fed. Thin animals are more susceptible. As I already mentioned, the paraparton female, that pregnant and lactating female, is more susceptible high producing, anything that's higher stress is going to make them more susceptible. And bottle babies. Bottle babies often begin the world in a compromised manner, so they are more susceptible than those being raised on their moms. Okay, general husbandry practices. Simply being a good producer, good hygiene and sanitation, uh, you know, keeping feeders clean, waterers clean, may be more important for coccidia, but it's still important. Don't feed on the ground. Try to avoid hot spots on the pasture where the animals constantly congregate. Try to minimize the stress uh, that your animals experience. Uh, after coming home from the fair or after being hauled, they're under more stress than they would be ordinarily. Lamb or kid at a time of the year when parasites are less active. If you lamb or kid in January, uh, there's going to be less problems with parasites then. Later weaning, if the lambs and kids are going to be finished on pasture diets, there's no reason to wean them at 60 days. Now, if you're going to put them in dry lot and finish them on concentrate diets, that's a different story. But if they're going to go to pasture with their moms, uh, there's evidence that keeping them on, say, till about 120 days of age would be advantageous. Because parasites are transmitted on pasture, uh, obviously how you manage your pasture and grazing is gonna have a big impact on uh, potential risk with parasites. Short duration grazing, uh, remember I mentioned that three or four days? If you move them every three or four days, they're not gonna be able to ingest that infective third stage larva, that L3. Now, sometimes it's gonna take three weeks. So keep that in mind. Three to four days is the shortest time, but it could take longer. So if you moved them every three days and put them back in the same field in three weeks, you actually might have more of a problem. So you need long rest periods. Typically about 60 days is what it takes to go from a highly infected pasture to a lowly infected pasture. Clean pasture, probably six to 12 months of rest. You want minimum grazing heights. You don't wanna be grazing at one to two inches. About 80% of the larva is found in the first, say three inches of vegetation. Some of it'll get higher, yes, but the majority of it is gonna be down low where the moisture is. Planting forages that grow taller, 
Um, keep those animals' heads up. This is particularly a good strategy with goats that are top-down grazers. Sheep seem, no matter how tall the forage is, that head's often on the ground. Browsing, uh, if you have goats, that's a natural strategy for uh, controlling parasite risk in goats. Taking a hay crop off of a field exposes the larva to the sunlight and can be a strategy. When you plant a new crop, that's essentially a clean pasture, so an annual forage crop. There are forages that contain, contain condensed tannins, uh, which have an inhibitory effect on parasites on the barber pole worm. An example would be Cerecia lespedeza, which is a warm season legume, bird's foot trefoil, which is a legume, and uh, there's some other plants in other parts of the world. Mixed spores, and what I mean by that is basically a salad bar, having different plants uh, for the animals to choose from. Grass plants tend to transmit parasites more than forbs or, um, or legumes. Uh, the other plant with condensed tannins, now that I mentioned forbs, is chicory. So a mixed sward of grasses and legumes and forbs and of course that plays right into what the goat wants because it likes to have a variety and sheep like to have a variety too. Mixed species grazing, generally speaking small ruminants have different parasites than other species. There is some cross infection with calves on the barber pole worm so if we're mixed species grazing cows would be better than calves, horses would be good. Remember I said you need a rumen in order to get the barber pole worm uh, so you if you're grazing horses or cattle, you're essentially resting that pasture. Uh, when they consume the plants that contain the barber pole worm larva, uh, they're going to reduce the chance that the sheep or goat does, and it's not going to affect them. And then the other way to manage pasture and grazing is not to graze, and I'm going to talk about that in another slide or two. Good nutrition. I already mentioned there's a nutritional cost to parasites. Animals in better body condition are better able to withstand the effects of parasitism. It's rare that you would see a fat animal just topple over from parasites. When we supplement with energy, so TDN, something like corn, that helps with parasite resilience, which is that toler tolerance to infection. So the animal might have a high level of infection, but because he's getting that energy supplement, he's better able to deal with it. If I supplement with protein, that helps with parasite resistance. Protein is necessary for that immune response. Good mineral nutrition is important as well. Uh, when we're talking about sheep or goats, it's better to give them a loose mineral uh, than to feed them a block. We want to manage our pastures so that the plants are kept in a vegetative, more nutritious state. And when we do supplement, we always want to supplement the most limiting nutrient to the most susceptible animals. In the mid-Atlantic area, the most limiting nutrient on pasture is energy. And so it makes sense to supplement energy. The most susceptible animals, we've already talked about those. They would be the young animals and the, and the mamas that are lactating, especially in that early part of lactation or say a high producing dairy goat. A pet that's in good body condition, they're pretty tolerant of parasites, particularly if they're over a year of age. Uh, genetic selection, this is something that's harder to do when you have just a handful of animals or if those animals have uh, some emotional value, like pets. But it is a strategy, particularly for uh, herds or flocks and production animals. There's basically two traits when we talk about selection. There's what we call resistance and there is resilience. So parasite resilience, you can think of that as tolerance, is the ability to tolerate infection. So the animal has a good FAMACHA score, meaning he's not anemic. He's got a good body condition score. Parasites aren't causing him to lose weight. Nutrition's allowing him to have a good condition. He's gaining weight or producing milk well. I don't need to deworm that animal. It's doing well. Um, it's resilient to parasites. So ideally what we want to do if we can is we want to cull any animal that requires deworming or more deworming. What's more depends on the flock. If I have to deworm any ewe in my flock, that's unusual. I could have a production system where I have more of a challenge and it's just frequent deworming or that second deworming that's a problem. But what you need to keep in mind, if all you do is cull animals that don't need dewormed, those animals that, that 
or, or call the ones that do need deworm, those that don't need deworm may still be shedding a lot of eggs onto the pasture. So that brings us to the second trait, which is parasite resistance. And that's the ability of the animal to prevent or clear infection. So it doesn't get a high fecal egg count or it's able to self cure. So we estimate parasite resistance by fecal egg count. In our buck test, we looked at both. But when we say we were trying to identify genetically superior bucks, we were really looking for those bucks with a low fecal egg count. It's a moderately heritable trait. And heritable means the portion of the differences that are due to genetics. So 20 to 30% of the difference in animals is due to genetics. The other uh, 70, 80% is, is, is management, is, is things that we can't always control or things we do control. We have what we call the 70-30 rule. So about 30% of the flock or herd is responsible for about 70% of the fecal egg output. So if I had, when I looked at our bucks and we'd have about 100 bucks, I, I would graph that and it, and it found out it was actually true that about 30% had most of those eggs. So from a production standpoint, we can cull those animals out. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to select animals, particularly males, that shed fewer eggs onto pasture. And then they pass that onto the next generation. And the reason I say males is because the male is going to influence a lot more babies than a female will. A female may have two or three babies a year. A male might produce 30 or 40. It just depends on the size of your flock or herd. So if you're able to use genetic selection, it is a tool uh, that can help control parasites. Okay, remember I said no grazing, zero grazing. This can play a role on some farms. There's very little transmission of worms in the barn, in, in confinement or in dry lot, okay? And what I mean by dry lot, of course a barn, I mean like you see these lambs, they're in a bedded building. Um, but dry lot would be, wouldn't be a bedded building, it might be outside, but in order for it not to pose a parasite risk, there can't be any grass in there, not even along the edges where they stick their heads out. It's got to be free from vegetation. Extremely susceptible or parasitized, parasitized animals should be kept in confinement or dry lot for at least a period of time. Ones that are really parasitized that you have to treat and, haven't, and aren't bouncing back, you should definitely keep them inside so they don't have a, a source of infection. If your pastures are too short, uh, either you've overgrazed them because you have too many animals, it's a drought and, and they just haven't been growing, you should put them in the barn or in dry lot. They shouldn't be out there. It's not good for the plants and it's gonna increase the parasite risk. If you, you often hear the term sacrifice area when we talk about pasture management. Well, sacrifice area for sheep and goats should be in the barn or dry lot because if you make it a paddock, it's going to be a high risk paddock uh, for parasites. Confined animals will not develop immunity to parasites. So keep that in mind, if you, bought, if you buy does or ewes from a farm that raised their animals in confinement, it's okay that they do that, but just understand that if you throw those animals out on pasture and it's a highly infected pasture, they might be overcome. They need to be gradually exposed as if they were younger. The one thing to keep in mind about zero grazing or no grazing is where stomach worms are less of a problem coccidia can be a greater problem because worms are transmitted from the larva on the forage on the grass whereas coccidia is transmitted in the feces so anything that's dirty inside a confinement can cause coccidia problems. A new product it's been on the market about a year is called Biowarma. I think this is actually a savior for small, really small farms who, who don't have enough, they call a nematode trapping fungus. Nematode is simply a fancy word for a roundworm. You feed this fungus to your livestock to prevent them from infecting the pastures with infected worm larvae. You can feed it to sheep, goats, llamas, alpacas, cows, horses, any animal. So the fungus traps and kills the worm larvae in the manure of the livestock. So it's a biological control. When you feed it to the animal, it has no effect in the animal. So if the animal is wormy and it's anemic, you still need to deworm it. But by consuming the fungus, you get that fungus in the manure 
and it kills the larva and it prevents the pastures from being contaminated. In fact, the way they, they went about this is they knew that fungus killed worm larva, but they needed to get it in the manure instead of the soil. So they had to find a fungus that could survive the digestion level, get it in the manure where it could do its job. So it's, it's a biological control. You need to feed it daily during peak transmission season. Again, basically temperature above 60 degrees and to your most susceptible animals. There's two products that are available. One is called BioWarma. It's a, basically a feed additive that you put into a large batch of feeds, say a ton or more. The second product is called Livamol with BioWarma, Warma, and you could, you could mix that with your own feed. It costs about 60 cents a day to feed a 100 pound animal with the Livamol product. So the more animals you have, obviously it's gonna cost more. And that's why I say on small farms with just a few animals, uh, I think it's, it's probably something that you should look at because you may have fewer of the other options available. So let's talk about the dewormers now. Hopefully you're doing things that are gonna minimize the need to use these dewormers, but they are uh, also part of our management program. So what is a dewormer? A dewormer is a drug that kills or expels worms by starving or paralyzing them. A dewormer has to be selectively toxic to the worms without killing the host. Today's dewormers, contrary to popular belief, are much safer and more powerful than older drugs or older time remedies. I hate to tell you some of the things that they used to de use to deworm livestock. The products that we have now are much better. We also call a dewormer an anthelmintic, so you'll often hear that term, but I'm gonna call them dewormers. So this chart here shows the dewormers that we have for small ruminants, sheep, goats, llamas, and alpacas. They fall into three general groups. It's interesting, I listened to a podcast from Ireland yesterday and they totally described their dewormers based on color. We can't do that anymore and I'll tell you why. So the benzimidazoles is the basically the oldest group of dewormers, 1960s technology. There was actually another one called thiabendazole that's off the market. These dewormers are white. Uh, fenbendazole, albendazole, and oxytazole. So these are highly uh, broad spectrum dewormers. They're the only group that has some efficacy against tapeworms and liver flukes. Uh, the, the significant thing about valbazin that it, it, that it not be used in the first 30 days of pregnancy, uh, it's the one labeled for tapeworms and liver flukes. That's the first group. The second group is the macrocylic lactones. These are clear. So in, in, in Ireland, they, they call these the clear dewormers, okay? We have two groups within here, the, what we call the avermectin. So they end in mectin. And so that's ivermectin, aprinomectrin, and doramectrin. And you can see the trade names. And then slightly different is moxidectin or cydectin. It's called a milbomycin. These drugs are similar, but there's also some difference. So it's kind of like one group with two subgroups. The cell depolarizers, levamisol used to be yellow. And so, it, so it maybe it is still yellow in Ireland, but it's not yellow here anymore, it's clear. So we can't simply separate the drugs on color. Uh, we've got two groups of medications here um, in, in our third group. So let's look at the ones that are approved for our sheep, goats, and camelids. Sheep were lucky. There is a approved drug in each group and basically subgroup. So valbazin is approved for sheep. Within the second group, we have ivermectin as a, an approved avermectin and moxidectin as an approved milbomycin. And in the third group, we have levamisole. Why are these groups important? Well, the groups that fall, the drugs that fall into a specific group have a similar chemistry and kill the worm in the same manner. When worms develop resistance, they develop resistance to the way in which they are killed. When they are resistant to one of those drugs in that group, cross resistance occurs fairly rapidly. So if, if, if a drug in one group doesn't work, you don't try another drug in the same group. So sheep people are lucky because they have a choice of a medication in each of those groups. Goat producers only have two products. Uh, they have one from the first group, basically Safeguard. And then they have one from the third group. 
which goes under goes by a bunch of different trade names. One of the advantages of the Rumatel or Morantel tartrate is there is no withdrawal period. So for dairy goats, that can be that's obviously a very positive thing. No dewormers are approved for llamas and alpacas. One of the most important things to understand as a small ruminant producer we are required often to use drugs in an extra label manner. So if I look at this chart right here, I would tell you that generally speaking, sheep people do not have to use drugs extra label, generally speaking, because they have an approved drug in each group. Goat people do, because typically we have a lot of resistance in that first group. The label for safeguard is actually inadequate, so that makes it extra label. And then camelids don't have anything. So anytime you use a medication, not just a dewormer, but any medication different than what's on its label, that means it has to be used what we call extra label, not off label. Off label is not a legal term in the United States, extra label. And it requires a veterinarian. So you can say it requires a veterinary prescription, but basically it requires you to have a veterinary client patient relationship so that you can use that medication. You may still be able to buy it over the counter, but you're supposed to involve your veterinarian. That means a different species. So Valbazin is, um, actually Valbazin does have a conditional license for goats for liver flukes. But generally speaking, if you wanted to use Valbazin to control barber pole worm in goats, that's extra label, okay? If you gave a different dosage, so if you doubled the dosage to safeguard, even though it's approved for goats, that is extra label. If you try squirting ivermectin injectable down the throat of an animal, not only is that not approved for the species, but it's not approved for that route of administration. You wanna give safeguard three days in a row, that's not what's on the label. So all of those conditions are would require extra label drug use and the involvement of a veterinarian. I mentioned earlier that one of the, challenges in cover, controlling the barber pole worm is dewormer resistance. So what dewormer resistance is, is the heritable ability of a worm to survive a dose of dewormer that should have killed it. So I give it the label dosage, the normal dosage, and it doesn't kill the worms. Heritable because that resistance is going to be passed on to the next generation of worms. Anytime the treatment fails to reduce fecal A count by more than 95% resistance is said to exist. You may not notice it when it kills 90% of the worms or even 80% of the worms. You might not notice it until it's only killing about 50% of the worms and you're noticing that the animal isn't getting better. You know, it's, it's the, the treatment is not alleviating the clinical symptoms. Resistance is generally thought to be permanent, meaning once that dewormer no longer works, it never will work again. A little bit change of thinking with that. Uh, levamisole is a little bit different in, in terms of its resistance. It's, if you remember the chart, uh, levamisole chemistries go back to the 1960s. So that's, that's, that's 60 years ago. And yet it's uh, still very effective on some farms. Uh, also, and I'm gonna talk about this in, in a few slides, uh, when we use combination treatments, which is using more than one dewormer at one time, uh, they are seeing some uh, reversion and susceptibility of, of worms to these dewormers. And I'll talk about that a little bit, a few slides later. So what's the current state of dewormer resistance uh, in the United States? I said before, and this is true, the worms have developed resistance, but it's variable the resistance to the dewormers and dewormer classes. It varies by geographic region and it varies by individual farm. The, the graph there on the right shows you how resistance is to the different drugs. Two different studies, one most recently done in Maryland, Virginia, and Georgia. And just to kind of to summarize what these results show is basically that all of the farms in the first study and the more recent study were resistant to the benzimidazoles, the white dewormers, Safeguard, and Valbazin. In the second study, all of the farms, most of the farms were resistant to ivermectin, the avermectins in the first study, and in the later study, 10 years later, all of the farms are resistant. There are some farms that still have susceptibility to both moxidectin and levamisol. Um, which goes by the name, trade name of Prohibit. 
uh, levamisole tends to be the most effective dewormer and moxidectin is still effective on many farms. We do see differences in geographic areas. If we were to split this out, we saw uh, much higher levels of resistance in Georgia, more resistance in Virginia than in Maryland. So the further you go south where more deworming has been used, been required, we have higher levels of resistance. When we go out west and further north, uh, you tend still to see resistance, but not as high a level. And you can see there's now up to about almost, what, 30% of the farms have resistance to all of the drugs. So it's a significant problem and a growing problem. It's only going to get worse. The only way to find out if the drugs work is to test for drug resistance. There's two ways we do that, and uh, one is a fecal A count reduction test, where you take fecal samples before treatment, and then uh, 10 to 14 days later, you do fecal samples from those same animals, and you compare them. You can test individual samples, or you can put those samples into a pooled sample, but you need to use at least 10 animals from each, for each group. Uh, you can't tell if a dewormer works by looking at the results of one animal. That tells you if that treatment was effective on that animal, but it doesn't tell you if resistance is present. You need a lot of drugs, or not of animals, if you want to test all the drugs with the fecal A count reduction test. You need about 250 eggs per gram. The cost varies. Uh, we now have three labs in the United States that'll do them for five dollars a sample. So that's pretty reasonable. You can also learn to do them yourself. A second test is called the drenched light larval development assay. You put a pooled sample together from about eight animals. You need an egg count of at least 500 eggs per gram. And it tests for resistance to all the drugs at the same time. It also identifies the species of parasites. It's a costly test, about $500 per sample. But I can tell you if you paid to have the same thing done with the individual fecal egg counts, it would be probably more plus a lot more work is involved. But those are the two ways you could find out if the drugs work on your farm. You do an individual animal, you can find out if, if it, the treatment worked on that animal. So what's the goal of deworming? Well, the important thing to understand about deworming is it's therapeutic and not prophylactic. In the old days, we dewormed a lot of animals with the idea that we were preventing problems. It's not a vaccine. There is a vaccine for a barber pole worm. It's not available in the United States, but we now need to look at using these dewormers because of the resistance as treatments, therapeutic, not prophylactic. We need to treat clinically parasitized animals to save their lives, improve their welfare, and reduce production losses. And we need to do it in a way that minimizes the development of resistant worms. The dewormers are a valuable but limited resource. If you remember the, the timeline on the bottom of that chart, we have not had a new dewormer since the, I think 1998 or 97 is when moxidectin, cydectin was on the market. Internationally, there's two new products, but and, and some of you, if you're from somewhere else, you may have access to them, but we do not have those products. It's a purple and an orange product, and we do not have them available in the United States. Just some general recommendations for using dewormers, always give them orally. Always use drench formulations. Do not use injectables, do not use porons. The only exception to that is the product for goats, which is a feed product. Obviously that has to be fed. Use an oral dosing syringe with a long metal nozzle to deliver the drug over the tongue into the oral cavity. Do not use a simple syringe. You cannot get it far enough back without getting bit. That, that uh, drug needs to go over the tongue. It needs not in the mouth. Use proper drenching technique, be gentle. Make sure the syringe delivers the proper amount of the drug. Make sure you deworm based on an accurate weight. Be careful not to underdose. The dewormers are generally quite safe. Uh, Levamisol or Prohibit has the narrowest margin of safety, but that's three times, meaning you'd have to think a 100-pound animal weighed 320 pounds. Hopefully, you're not that far off. Don't underdose, okay? If you don't have a scale, there are ways of using measurements to estimate weight. Follow the labels and store the products properly. Because the treatments are therapeutic and not prophylactic, it is recommended that you do what's called targeted selective treatment. 
That's the strategy for small ruminants. Only deworming animals that require treatment or would benefit from treatment. You're always going to leave some animals untreated. By choosing who needs treated, you're going to reduce the number of treatments and you're going to increase refugia, which prolongs the effectiveness of the drugs. So what's refugia? Refugia are worms that have not been exposed to the dewormers. If you look at this picture and think of this as an example flock, we've got um, a flock where we're going to only deworm 20% because that's all it needed it. And I'm going to assume that these sheep were full of half resistant worms and half susceptible worms. And when I deworm 20%, I still got a lot of susceptible worms in the population. If I deworm all of those sheep, the only worms that survive are resistant, okay? And then if you were to put those sheep on a clean pasture, the only worms on that pasture would be resistant, which means you could not um, treat those animals that became parasitized. So we only want to treat the ones that need it, which usually means deworming only a portion of that group of animals. There's different tools that can help you make that decision of who needs dewormed. You know, I got 20 sheep or 20 goats. How do I know which ones need deworm? Well, here's a couple of the uh, strategies. Because this presentation is about the barber pole worm, we're going to focus on the first one, which is the FAMACHA eye anemia system. And there's some other things that I'll talk a little bit about or not, but can be used for other parasites. So the FAMACHA eye anemia system is that color eye chart you see there on the right. It estimates the pack cell volume. It estimates the level of anemia, which is the primary symptom of the barber pole worm. So there are five colors, five scores, five categories, and five treatment recommendations. So the first two, red and pinkish red, are not anemic, no reason to treat. The latter two, four and five, a pinkish white and a white, those are high levels of anemia and you need to treat that animal. You, I don't know if you can see the card, but that pink color has a question mark. So you got to do a little more thinking when deciding whether or not to treat a FAMACHA 3. You need to check susceptible animals bi-weekly, sometimes even more frequently, depending on the weather, during the peak worm transmission season, which might be June, July, and August, maybe into September for um, Maryland. It could be different depending on where you live. In Maryland, there's no reason to be FAMACHA scoring in January. You must complete a training in order to purchase a card. They want to make sure that you use proper technique, which is cover, push, pull, pop, and want to make you understand everything about uh, how to implement the FAMACHA system. Due to COVID-19, there's a lot of online training that's available. I did an online training in May. Those videos are online. You can watch the videos, take the test, and send a video of you scoring and then you can get certified and buy a card. The five-point check is an extension of the FAMACHA system. It includes other criteria that can be used to make deworming decisions for other parasites, the ones that cause more digestive upset, but also it's pretty useful for trying to make that decision for that FAMACHA 3. The five points are the eye, which is the uh, lower eyelid for the FAMACHA score and anemia. The back, which is body condition score. In adult animals, body condition can be a, a very good criteria for making deworming decisions. The tail, we're basically looking for fecal soiling or evidence of scouring or diarrhea. That would be uh, indicative of the worms that cause scours. The jaw for bottle jaw and the nose, we're looking for a nasal discharge. There is a parasite that gets into the nasal passages. So that's the five point check. And, and the whole point is never just look at the FAMACHA score, look at the whole animal when making a deworming decision. What about fecal exams? It's very common that people think, well, if I wanna decide whether I need to deworm that animal, I should do a fecal exam. Well, if you remember I said, really the diagnostic test would be a blood test. We're looking for anemia. We're, that's the primary thing we're looking at. So what you should do is you should make deworming decisions based on the assessment of the clinical signs, not the result of a fecal exam, not on one animal. And if that fecal exam is qualitative, meaning you don't get a count, 
that's not very useful at all. We expect to see worm eggs. It's how many that is more important. While the fecal egg count is generally predictive, it is not always very indicative of the worm load and the need for deworming. Fecal egg counts are very complicated as far as their, um, where they fit into making deworming decisions. The other thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, all the roundworm eggs, strongyl type, they look alike. Uh, with the exception of nematodirus, which is a problem maybe in Ireland, but not really in most parts of the United States, they are all similar size and they look alike. So you could have an egg count of, of, of 2,000 eggs per gram, which is not that high for barber pole worm, but would be very high for the others. So you really would want to know what kind of parasites. You have to hatch those eggs and identify them from larvae. As I mentioned before though, you could do a before and after fecal egg count to see if that treatment was effective on that animal. The greater use of fecal egg counts is to determine whether or not the drugs are working, to determine which animals are more resistant, like we did in our buck test. You can also do fecal egg counts to see what level of contamination your pastures carry. I mentioned combination treatments. Because the worms have developed resistance to all the new dewormers, all the dewormers and dewormer classes, and we're not getting new dewormers, it's now recommended that small ruminants with clinical signs of paratism be given a combination treatment. What a combination treatment is, is when you give more than one dewormer at the same time, sequentially, one after the other, don't mix them, three different syringes, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to kill the maximum number of worms of the same kind. So I don't mean use two drugs because you need to kill roundworms and tapeworms. I mean two drugs because I want two, two or three drugs trying to kill the barber pole worm. We're trying to get an additive effect. If I rotate a dewormer, I'm not getting an additive effect. So by giving them at the same time, I'm getting an additive effect. So I got a thousand eggs, the first treatment, the first drug kills 90%, uh, I've got 100 eggs left. The second one kills 80%, I've got 20 eggs left. The last one kills 50%, I've only got 10 eggs left. I'm trying to maximize that treatment. We want to use the most potent drug from each drug class. We want to give it at full dose. The most potent drug from each class is usually valbazin, cydectin, and prohibit. So each of those three drugs. We want to admit it was just this one slide which was on copper oxide wire particles. I just wanted to talk about them as, as an alternative. Um, they are specific to the barber pole worm. They don't work for any other parasite. Um, they're these little tiny rods of copper oxide. If you, you can see in the picture, uh, they're a slowly poorly absorbed form of copper, which is very different than an old time dewormer called copper sulfate. That caused a lot of toxicity issues, particularly with sheep. If, if you have sheep, you, you hopefully are aware that they're very sensitive to copper. Um, so a lot of research has shown that these copper oxide wire particles can reduce barber pole worm infections in small ruminants. I mentioned there was a study at USDA that combined valbazin, which is a very ineffective dewormer, with copper oxide wire particles, and they had a very highly effective treatment. That was just one study, but uh, it's just definitely shows promise. These copper oxide wire particles are uh, available as copper supplements for either cattle or goats. So the cattle supplement is shown at the bottom of that picture. It's a bolus that has either 12 and a half or 25 grams of those little, little metal wads. And so what you do is you repackage those dosage into a smaller dosage to deworm sheep and goats. Because even four grams is too much for deworming, especially a sheep. So um, you can buy gel caps on Amazon. You want to give about a half to one gram to a lamb or kid. It's based on age, not weight. And then one to two grams for mature animals. So you could use the two gram uh, bolus for goats to deworm an adult sheep, but that's too much for a lamb or kid. You give it with a plastic balling gun. It's not the easiest thing to give. It's a lot easier to drench. But I found if you take that plastic balling gun and cut the end of it off, that'll work. Uh, I think Jeffers often, often also sells one, um, off, also sells one that you can use to give it. The important thing when you use copper oxide wire particles is to use them safely. Because again, if you're a sheep person, you're saying, whoa, I'm not certain I should use copper. What I recommend for sheep people is to make sure that you uh, know what the copper status of your farm is. Copper metabolism, copper is very complicated. You never want to add it to your system without knowing what your situation is. 
If you think you have a deficiency, do some testing. If you think you have excesses, do some testing. And I think 